<laughs> welcome, welcome along. Hi, welcome to more ghost stories with me, Luke. Hi, everybody. How are we doing? Great to uh, see you all. I've been keeping an eye on the chat as it goes. Hey, 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 everybody. Hey, Luke. Hello, Luke says LeBlanc. Hey, everyone. Great to see you all. Great to see you. We've got some good ghost stories for you today. We're going to read uh, a couple more. Mr. James. Love coming back to Mr. James. Um, Such good. Such good ghost stories. So creepy. So I'm really looking forward to these ones. I've read them both. Um, they're quite short, so we're going to do two. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, they're fun. I think you're going to like them. And they're creepy. David Badalotti, thank you so much for chipping in. Um, much appreciated in there with the donation. Uh, right off the bat. Hi, 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 hi. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm sure lots of people in the chat mentioning Bloodborne because everyone else had extra. I just completed Bloodborne today. So I am relaxed. Or, you know, at least more relaxed than I have been in a while because I don't have to play... Bloodborne anymore. I love playing it, but it's also nice to not have to play it anymore. Oh, Nick Nick Jeffrey, thank you for the super chat, says Hi, spook ghost away. Okay, yep. Strong. Strong name punning. Nimble Tax says, Hi Luke, these streams and Oxbox have really kept me going during lockdown. It's my birthday Saturday. I'm not that old, but I landed on the planet a year before Neil Armstrong landed on the moon. Oh my gosh. Amazing. Nimble Tack, happy birthday for Saturday. Hope you uh, hope you have a great one. Gentle Mandrill says, good evening, Luke. Hope you could relax a little after that blood morning. And yay for MR James stories. They're my faves. They're my favourites too. I think like definitely my favourite author we've 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 covered on these streams so far in terms of consistency. The Edgy Gamer, thank you very much for the super chat. Says at last time I'm able to catch one of these live again. Thank you for the amazing work you do, Luke. Makes quarantine here in um, Boise a little less dull. I hope I've said that right. Boise, Boise. I want to say Boise, but that's just because, as with all locations, I've just heard it mentioned once in a sitcom that was shown in the UK or something. So yeah, I hope I got that right. Uh, Fancy Space Owl, thank you. Says hey, Luke. So we had an idea in the chat. When COVID-19 is over, can we all meet up in a forest at night and read spooky stories at a campfire together? Thank you so much for your streams. They help a lot during these times. Oh my gosh, that sounds... Well, that sounds terrifying. It sounds awesome, but... I mean... Like... That's just... I mean, that's that's just an open invitation to the ghosts and the demons and the witches, isn't it? But maybe that's the plan. You know, the ghosts and the demons and the witches... They'll, they'll want to celebrate when lockdown is over as well. With a blood feast. Rebecca M says, genuine question. How do you enjoy Persuasion, Luke? It's one of my favourite Austin adaptations, so I'm curious. Yeah, I got the uh, 1994 
five um persuasion bbc persuasion with kieran hines on dvd watched it over the weekend brilliant absolutely loved it absolutely loved it so good um john sharplin says nice to see you this evening mr westway can't hang around so i'll have to catch the vod later here's a tip and give those lovely people a good spookening thank you john thank you very much for the chat uh and this from Athanasius, who says, Woot, congrats on finishing Bloodborne earlier. I love all you do both here on Oxtra. Looking forward to more spookenings. Sweet. Sweet, sweet, sweet. Um, Yeah, it's going to be a good one. These are going to be good ones. Uh, before, we before we crack on, um, I think, I think like, how long are these stories? Am I going to try and read them all in one go, or am I going to take breaks? We'll just see. Tom Titherington says, I can't put my finger on it, but you seem different, happier somehow. Maybe it's just that. It's just that sort of back of the mind knowledge that I completed Bloodborne. And I don't have to. And I no longer have to complete Bloodborne. It's off the slate, which is great. Cat Crossley says, it's my birthday tomorrow. Happy, bir happy advanced birthday. And I'm so excited to enjoy spooky stories and a cold cider. Congrats for the Bloodborne win. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Well, tonight I am drinking in my... Spooky Red Vessel of Doom. We have got rum and orange juice. And I was making it quite quickly because I was sort of rushing to get the stream ready. And um, so I went pretty I went pretty heavy on the rum. Mm. Oh. oh, yes. Lord Gandhi 69 says, congrats on Bloodborne. Will you ever play Dark Souls 2 or 3? A lot of people asking me that maybe i can't even i can't even think about that sort of stuff right now i have to just i i can't even i can't even think about it the uh, right now the idea seems appalling but who knows i will probably mellow on that subject and oh my goodness so many there's so many super chats coming in um angela sanchez says hi luke thanks for the spooking streams they've been great i've just gotten accepted to my first choice grad program so i wanted to share some money before i spend it all on my degree oh angela sanchez that's so generous not ne not necessary but thank you so much that's so kind um yeah good that's awesome grad program you're gonna put the rad in grad and the eg in degree for example my cool degree if you're looking for examples of cool things my degree is one of them okay um right try, try. oh my hand vanished into the background when i held my oh, no wonder where is it oh yeah look at that look at that green screen just getting a little regret look at that it's like i'm it's like i'm the t1000 amazing cool right so um as always um Let's do the disclaimer. We read these stories because it's interesting to see the genesis of, of horror and, and gothic horror is interesting and really fun and, and, and spooky. But sometimes the real horror can be Victorian attitudes to things like um, nationality, race, mental health, women, gender, sexuality. Uh, did I already say sexuality? I, I can't remember. Um, uh, d d colonialism, uh, I, just about everything. Victorians were awful. Is Athanasius putting it? Yeah, yeah, that's probably that's probably the just the the, the catch-all for it. Um, okay, so we, today we're reading a school story and the rose garden. I thought we would do a school story first. Right, I've I've witted on for quite long enough, so let's crack on, shall we? This is a school story by M. R. James. Sort my hair out slightly. Yeah, that'll do. Two men in a smoking room were talking of their private school days. At our school, said Anthony, we had a ghost footmark on the staircase. What was it like? Oh, very unconvincing, just the shape of a shoe, with a square toe, if I remember right. The staircase was a, a stone one. I never heard any story about the thing. That seems odd when you've come to think of it. Why didn't somebody invent one, I wonder? You can tell with little boys they have a mythology of their own. There's a subject for you, by the way, the folklore of private schools. Yes, the crop is rather scanty, though. I imagine if you were to investigate the cycle of ghost stories, for instance, which the boys at private schools tell each other, they would all turn out to be highly compressed versions of stories out of books. Nowadays, the Strand and Pearsons and so on would be extensively drawn upon. No doubt. They weren't born or thought of in my time. Let's see, um... I wonder if I can remember the staple ones that I was told. 
Uh, ah, first, there was the house, with a room in which a series of people insisted on passing a night, and each of them in the morning was found kneeling in a corner and had just time to say, I've seen it, and died. Wasn't that the house in Berkeley Square? I dare say it was. Uh, then there was the man who heard a noise in the passage at night, opened his door and saw someone crawling towards him on all fours with his eye hanging out on his cheek. Uh, there was besides, let me think, yes, the room where a man was found dead in bed with a horseshoe mark on his forehead. And I, I don't know why that one was, but there was also the lady who, unlocking her bedroom door in a strange house, heard a thin voice among the bed curtains say, Now we're shut in for the night. None of those had any explanation or a sequel. I wonder if they go on still, those stories. Oh, likely enough, with additions from the magazines, as I said. You never heard, did you, of a real ghost at a private school? I thought not. Nobody has that ever I came across. From the way in which you said that, I gather you have. I don't really know, but this is what was in my mind. It happened at my private school 30-odd years ago, and I haven't any explanation of it. The school, I mean, was near London. It was established in a large and fairly old house, a great white building with very fine grounds about it. There were large cedars in the garden, as there are in so many of the older gardens in the Thames Valley, and ancient elms in the three or four fields which were used for our games. I think probably it was quite an attractive place, but boys seldom allow that their schools possess any tolerable features. I came to the school in a September, soon after the year 1870, and among the boys who arrived on the same day was one whom I took to, a Highland boy who I will call MacLeod. I needn't spend time describing him. The main thing is that I got to know him very well. He was not an exceptional boy in any way, not particularly good at books or games, but he suited me. The school was a large one. There must have been from 120, 130 boys there as a rule. And so a considerable staff of masters was required and there were rather frequent changes among them. One term, perhaps it was my third or fourth, a new master made his appearance. His name was Sampson. He was a tallish, stoutish, pale, black-bearded man. I think we liked him. He had travelled a good deal and had stories which amused us on our school walks, so that there was some competition among us to get within earshot of him. I remember too, dear me, I've hardly thought of it since then, he had a charm on his watch chain that attracted my attention one day, and he let me examine it. It was, I'd now suppose, a gold Byzantine coin. There was an effigy of some absurd emperor on one side, the other side had been worn practically smooth, and he had cut on it, rather barbarously, his own initials, GWS, and a date, 24 July, 1865. Yeah, I can, I can see it now. He told me he had picked it up in Constantinople. It was about the size of a, a florin, perhaps, or maybe a bit smaller. Well, the first odd thing that happened was this. Samson was doing Latin grammar with us. One of his favourite methods, perhaps it is rather a good one, was to make us construct sentences out of our own heads to illustrate the rules he was trying to make us learn. Of course, that is a thing which gives a silly boy a chance of being impertinent. There are a lot of school stories in which that happens, or anyhow there might be. But Samson was too good a disciplinarian for us to think of trying that on with him. Now, on this occasion, he was telling us how to express remembering in Latin. And he ordered us each to make a sentence bringing in the verb memini, I remember. Well, most of us made up some ordinary sentence, such as I rem remember my father, or he remembers his book, or something equally uninteresting. And I dare say a good many put down memino librum meum and so forth, but the boy I mentioned, MacLeod, was evidently thinking of something more elaborate than that. The rest of us wanted to have our sentences passed and get on to something else, so some kicked him under the desk and I, who was next to him, poked him and whispered to him to look sharp. But he didn't seem to attend. I looked at his paper and saw he had put down nothing at all. So I jogged him again, harder than before, and upbraided him sharply for keeping us all waiting. That did have some effect. He started and seemed to wake up, and then very quickly he scribbled about a couple of lines on his paper and showed it up with the rest. As it was the last, or nearly the last, to come in, and as Samson had a good deal to say to the boys who had written Meminiscimus Patri Mio and the rest of it, it turned out that the clock struck twelve before he had got to MacLeod, and MacLeod had to wait afterwards to have his sentence corrected. There was nothing much going on outside when I got out, so I waited for him to come. He came very slowly when he did arrive, and I guess there had been some sort of trouble. Well, 
I said. What did you get? Oh, I don't know, said MacLeod. Nothing much, but I think Samson's rather sick with me. Why, did you show him up some rot? No fear, he said. It was all right as far as I could see. It was like this. Memento, that's right enough for remember, and it takes a genitive. Memento putae inter quatuor taxos. What silly rot? I said, what made you shove that down? What's it mean? That's the funny part, said MacLeod. I'm not quite sure what it does mean. All I know is it just came into my head and I corked it down. I know what I think it means, because just before I wrote it down, I had a sort of picture of it in my head. I believe it means, remember the well among the four. <laughs> what are those dark sorts of trees that have red berries on them? Mountain ashes, I suppose you mean? I never heard of them, said MacLeod. No, I'll tell you, it was yous. Well, and what did Samson say? Well, he was jolly odd about it. When I read it, he got up and went to the mantelpiece and stopped quite a long time without saying anything, with his back to me. And then he said, without turning round and rather quiet, What do you suppose that means? I told him what I thought, only I couldn't remember the name of the silly tree. And then he wanted to know why I put it down, and I'd say something or other. And after that he left off talking about it, and asked me how long I'd been here, and where my people lived, and things like that, and then I came away, but he wasn't looking a bit well. I don't remember any more that was said by either of us about this. The next day MacLeod took to his bed with a chill or something of the kind, and it was a week or more before he was in school again, and as much as a month went by without anything happening that was noticeable. Whether or not Mr. Sampson was really startled, as MacLeod had thought, he didn't show it. I'm pretty sure, of course, now that there was something very curious in his past history, but I'm not going to pretend that we boys were sharp enough to guess any such thing. There was one other incident of the same kind as the last which I told you. Several times since that day we had to make up examples in school to illustrate different rules, but there had never been any row except when we did them wrong. At last there came a day where we were going through those dismal things which people call conditional sentences, and we were told to make a conditional sentence expressing a future consequence. We did it, right or wrong, and showed up our bits of paper, and Samson began looking through them. And all at once he got up, made some odd sort of noise in his throat, and rushed out by a door that was just by his desk. We sat there for a minute or two, and then, I suppose it was incorrect, but we went up, me and one or two others, to look at the papers on his desk. Of course, I thought someone must have put down some nonsense or other, and Samson had gone off to report him. All the same, I noticed that he hadn't taken any of the papers with him when he ran out. Well, the top paper on the desk was written in red ink, which no one used, and it wasn't in anyone's hand who was in the class. They all looked at it, MacLeod and all, and took their dying oaths that it wasn't theirs. Then I thought of counting the bits of paper, and of this I made quite certain that there were 17 bits of paper on the desk, and 16 boys in the form. Well, I bagged the extra paper and kept it, and I believe I have it now, and now you will want to know what was written on it. It was simple enough and harmless enough, I should have said. C2 non veneris ad me... Ego veniam ad te, which means, I suppose, if you don't come to me, I'll come to you. Could you show me the paper? interrupted the listener. Yes, I could, but there's another odd thing about it. That same afternoon, I took it out of my locker. I know for certain it was the same bit, for I made a finger mark on it, and no single trace of writing of any kind was there on it. I kept it, as I said, and since that time I've tried various experiments to see whether sympathetic ink has been used, but absolutely without result. Oh, so much for that. After about half an hour, Samson looked in again, said he felt very unwell, and told us we might go. He came rather gingerly to his desk and gave just one look at the uppermost paper, and I suppose he thought he must have been dreaming. Anyhow, he asked no questions. That day was a half-holiday, and next day Samson was in school again, much as usual. That night, the third and last incident in my story happened. Well, MacLeod and I slept in a dormitory at right angles to the main building. Samson slept in the main building on the first floor. There was a very bright moon. At an hour which I can't tell exactly, but sometime between one and two, I was woken by somebody shaking me. It was MacLeod, and a, a nice state of mind he seemed to be in. Come, he said. 
Come, there's a burglar getting in through Samson's window. As soon as I could speak, I said, Well, why not call out and wake everybody up? No, no, he said. I'm not sure who it is. Don't make a row. Come and look. Naturally, I came and looked, and naturally there was no one there. I was cross enough and should have called McLeod plenty of names, only I, I couldn't tell why. It seemed to me that there was something wrong, something that made me very glad I wasn't alone to face it. We were still at the window looking out, and as soon as I could I asked him what he had heard or seen. I didn't hear anything at all, he said. But about five minutes before I woke you, I found myself looking out of this window here, and there was a man sitting or kneeling on Samson's window sill, and looking in, and I thought he was beckoning. What sort of man? McLeod wriggled. I don't know, he said. But I can tell you one thing, he was beastly thin, and he looked as if he was wet all over. And, he said, looking round and whispering as if he hardly liked to hear himself, I'm not at all sure that he was alive. We went on talking in whispers some time longer and eventually crept back to bed. No one else in the room woke or stirred the whole time. I believe we did sleep a bit afterwards, but we were very cheap the next day. And the next day Mr Sampson was gone not to be found, and I believe no trace of him has ever come to light since. In thinking it over, one of the oddest things about it all has seemed to me the fact that neither MacLeod nor I ever mentioned what we had seen to any third person whatever. Of course, no questions were asked on the subject, and if they had been, I'm inclined to believe that we could not have made any answer. We seemed unable to speak about it. That is my story, said the narrator. The only approach to a ghost story connected with a school that I know, but still, I think, an approach to such a thing. The sequel to this may perhaps be reckoned highly conventional, but a sequel there is, and so it must be produced. There had been more than one listener to the story, and in the latter part of that same year, or of the next, one such listener was staying at a country house in Ireland. One evening his host was turning over a drawer full of odds and ends in the smoking room. Suddenly he put his hand upon a little box. Now, he said, you know about old things. Tell me what this is. My friend opened the little box and found in it a thin gold chain with an object attached to it. He glanced at the object and then took off his spectacles to examine it more narrowly. What's the history of this? He asked. Odd enough, was the answer. You know the yew thicket in the shrubbery? Well, a year or two back we were cleaning out the old well that used to be in the clearing here. And what do you suppose we found? Is it possible that you found a body? said the visitor with an odd feeling of nervousness. We did that, but what's more, in every sense of the word, we found two. Good heavens, two? Was there anything to show how they got there? Was, was this thing found with them? It was. Amongst the rags of the clothes that were on one of the bodies. A bad business, whatever the story of it may have been. One body had the arms tight round the other. They must have been there thirty years or more long enough before we came to this place. You may judge we filled the well up fast enough. Do you make anything of what's cut on that gold coin you have there? I think I can, said my friend, holding it to the light, but he read it without much difficulty. It seems to be GWS, 24 July, 1865. The end. The end. What do we think of that? I liked that one. I liked that one. Understated. The uh, ghostly figure on the windowsill. Creepy. Real creepy. Um, and again, as always with M.R. James, you can get through the whole story and there's not that much to like really freak you out in it, but just one or two turns of phrases just just really send the shiver down the spine and for me it was the description of the man like crouched on a windowsill appearing to be soaking wet but of course he's come out of a well and the other one was the description of the two corpses um one body had the arms tight round the other 
which just makes me think that obviously like we don't really find out i guess it's left to the imagination like what's the history of this school teacher what did he do in his past or something that's that he's being haunted by this but clearly that ghost grabbed him oh sorry hit my pop shield there grabbed him bodily magically teleported him to a well and that's just where they were for 30 years creepy creepy NimbleTac says, it's odd that there's no explanation, but you get the impression he was murdered by the schoolmaster. The ending felt oddly tacked on. Yeah, a bit tacked on, but uh, but I kind of like it in that kind of sort of, in the sense that at the end it's like, but there is, of course, a little sequel to this story. Everyone was dead the whole time, you know, that kind of thing. I enjoyed that one, says Silver Salamence 10. Hmm. Maybe the true horror was the Latin we found along the way, says Katie Douglas. Yeah! That's right. I'm back reading Latin. Yeah. I like that one. What did you guys think? Let me know what you, you folks thought of it. <laughs> Dan says, dead wet man on the windowsill. Cool, let's go back to bed. Yeah! That was the other thing. It's the thing that they... um. Uh, didn't uh, tell anyone what they saw. I'm like, if your school, if your teacher went missing, I would think it's a pertinent bit of information that the night before you saw a soaking wet man on their windowsill appearing to beckon and you weren't sure if he was alive. I would say that's pertinent information. But there you go. Jane DeHart says, I love how he keeps the origins up to the imagination. It makes it scarier. Sorry, it just in the room I'm in, I've got a light bulb that's out or like it's kind of slightly broken and it just really, really made me jump just now and gave me the creeps because I was just reading the thing and just this light just came on like just on the other end of the room. So I'm being haunted, so that's good. Claire T. Rex says, I mean, compared to the Karnaki stories, anything is understated. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. it's a cool one. JP Trick says, I liked it. The space and the details of what happened leaves lots of room to scare yourself with what happened or why. Shy Violet says, Luke didn't remain unhaunted, shaking my head. You were supposed to remain unhaunted, Luke, says Secret Agent Sam. I know, I know, I know, I know. Right. We've got another story to read. One more. Um, it's called The Rose Garden. It's in the same uh, sort of anthology of short stories. And it's cool. So we will crack on. But first, I want to know, is there anyone in the chat who this is uh, the first stream that they're catching? If so, let me know so I can give you a shout out. And I also want to know what everyone's drinking. If anyone's, you know, snacking, eating. I know time zones are different, everyone. Uh, everywhere, you know, around the world. Some people might be tuning in from the United States. You know the ones I mean. Of America. And for them it's much earlier in the day. Jackie the Fool says water. Drinking the water. Ah. Jinxon says. I, I think I've probably pronounced that right. JXN NYD says. Me lol. First story stream. Hey welcome along. Welcome. First stream from Texas. Says Turtle Bud. Hey. Welcome along folks. First stream followed after seeing you beat Bloodborne. Says Camrys. Ah oh, cool. Thank you. Well, that's rad. This is a much easier stream on me. I just have to read. What rum are you drinking, says Stephen Robson. What rum am I drinking? Um, nothing fancy. Because it's the rum that I'm mixing with the OJ, you know? So it's not the good stuff. Um, it's just from a supermarket or something. Own brand. T says Siri... Kautsky, lovely. Cider, says Matt Norris. Nice. Derek John says, I'm unfortunately restricted to water as I'm recovering from surgery. Oh my goodness, Derek John. That, that sounds intense. I hope you feel better soon. I hope the recovery's going well. Was drinking whiskey. Says, I'm a fathead. And Sayo says, Mountain Dew, hot chocolate and a marathon, says Nimble Tack. Lovely. Ah, oh, and Matastrophic says, first time here, got my nachos and tea. Amazing. Amazing. Great combo. Sidley Park Hermit says, first time I've gotten here at the beginning. Cheers from California. Cheers. Cheers, California. Congratulations on your cool bridges and wonderful climate. 
Okay. <laughs> right. Shall we... Crack on with story two. The Rose Garden. Elegant Egotist says, I'm technically at work, so I can't drink until I'm done. I'm in Minnesota. And Lucentia says, my sister's lizard is staring creepily at me through the glass. He's not moving. Oh, gosh. Oh, the Edgy Gamer says, California definitely does not have a wonderful climate currently. Oh, man. Yeah, that is very true. That is very true. Hmm. I'm checking the I'm just Google to check the latest there. Oh, man. Looks so frightening. I hope everyone in California is doing all right. Staying safe. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Stay safe, folks. Oh, man. Okay. Well, that's some bad news. Um, yeah. Oh, man. Look after yourselves. West Coast. Okay. Right. We are going to crack on with the Rose Garden. Um... Oh, that's nice, yeah. Lots of people in the chat saying stay safe, California. Yeah, little heart emojis. Very nice. Very good. Very good. Oh, and a pronunciation tip there on that username. Cheeksend. Cheeksend. Okay, cool. All right. Got it. <laughs> Got it. Right. The Rose Garden. What will you make of this one? I do not know. Mr. and Mrs. Anstruther were at breakfast in the parlour of Westfield Hall, in the county of Essex. They were arranging plans for the day. George, said Mrs. Anstruther, I think you'd better take the car to Malden and see if you can get any of those knitted things I was speaking about which would do for my stall at the bazaar. Oh well, if you wish it, Mary, of course I can do that, but I had half arranged to play around with Geoffrey Williamson this morning. The bazaar isn't till Thursday of next week, is it? What has that to do with it, George? I should have thought you would have guessed that if I can't get the things I want in Malden, I should have to write to all manner of shops in town, and they are certain to send something quite unsuitable in price or quality the first time. If you had actually made an appointment with Mr. Williamson, you had better keep it, but I must say I think you might have let me know. Oh, no, 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 it, it wasn't really an appointment. I, I quite see what you mean. Uh, I'll, I'll go. Uh, and what shall you do with yourself? Why, when the work of the house is arranged for, I must see about laying out my new rose garden. By the way, before you start for Malden, I wish you would just take Collins to look at the place I fixed upon. You know it, of course. Uh, well, I, I'm not sure that I quite do, Mary. Uh, is it at the upper end, towards the village? Good gracious, no, my dear George. I thought I'd make that quite clear. No, no, it's the small clearing just off the shrubbery path that goes towards the church. Oh, yes, where we were saying there must have been a summer house once, the, the place with the old seat and the post. But do you think there's enough sun there? My dear George, do allow me some common sense, and don't credit me with all your ideas about summer houses. Yes, there will be plenty of sun when we have got rid of some of those box bushes. I know what you're going to say, and I have as little wish as you to strip the place bare. All I want Collins to do is to clear away the old seats and the posts and things before I come out in an hour's time, and I hope you will manage to get off fairly soon. After luncheon, I think I shall go on with my sketch of the church. And if you please, you can go over to the links or... Ah, ah good idea. Very good. Yes, you finish the sketch, Mary. And I, I should be glad of a round, actually, now that you mention it. I was going to say you might call on the bishop, but I suppose it is no use my making any suggestion. And now do be getting ready or half the morning will be gone. Mr. Anstruther's face, which had shown symptoms of lengthening, shortened itself again and he hurried from the room and was soon heard giving orders in the passage. Mrs Anstruther, a stately dame of some fifty summers, proceeded after a second consideration of the morning's letters to her housekeeping. Within a few minutes, Mr Anstruther had discovered Collins in the greenhouse, and they were on their way to the site of the projected rose garden. 
I do not know much about the conditions most suitable to these nurseries, but I am inclined to believe that Mrs Anstruther, though in the habit of describing herself as a great gardener, had not been well advised in the selection of a spot for the purpose. It was a small, dank clearing, bounded on one side by a path, and on the other by thick box bushes, laurels and other evergreens. The ground was almost bare of grass and dark of aspect. Remains of rustic seats and an old and corrugated oak post somewhere near the middle of the clearing had given rise to Mr Anstruther's conjecture that a summer house had once stood there. Clearly Collins had not been put in possession of his mistress's intentions with regards to this plot of ground, and when he learned them from Mr Anstruther he displayed no enthusiasm. Of course I could clear them seats away soon enough he said. They aren't no ornament to the place, Mr Anstruther, and rotten too. Look here, sir. And he broke off a large piece. Rotten right through. Yeah, clear them away. To be sure, yeah, we can do that. And the post, said Mr Anstruther, that's got to go too. Collins advanced and shook the post with both hands. Then he rubbed his chin. That's firm in the ground, that post is, he said. Well, that's been there quite a number of years, Mr. Anstruther. I doubt I shan't get that up not quite so soon as what I can do with them seats. But your mistress specifically wishes it to be got out of the way in an hour's time, said Mr. Anstruther. Colin smiled and shook his head slowly. You'll excuse me, sir, but you can feel of it for yourself. No, sir, no one can't do what's impossible to him, can they, sir? I could get that post up by tea time, sir. That'll want a lot of digging. What you require, you see, sir, if you'll excuse my naming of it. You want the soil loosening round this here post, and me and the boy, we should take a little time doing of that. Uh, but now, these here seats, said Collins, appearing to appropriate this portion of the scheme as due to his own resourcefulness. Well, I can get the barrier around and have them cleared away in oh, less than an hour's time from now, if you'll permit it. Only... Only what, Collins? Well, now it ain't for me to go against orders no more than what it is for you yourself or, or anyone else. This was added somewhat hurriedly. But if you'll pardon me, sir, this, this ain't the place I should have picked out for no rose garden myself. Look at them box and Lauristinus. They regular preclude the light from coming. Yes, but we've got to get rid of them, of course. Oh, indeed, get rid of them, yes, to be sure. But I beg your pardon, Mr. Anstruther. I'm sorry, Collins, but I must be getting on now. I, I, I hear the car at the door. Your mistress will explain exactly what she wishes. I'll, I'll tell her then that you can see your way to clearing away the seats at once and the post this afternoon. Good morning. Collins was left rubbing his chin. Mrs Anstruther received the report with some discontent, but did not insist upon any change of plan. By four o'clock that afternoon, she had dismissed her husband to his golf, had dealt faithfully with Collins and with the other duties of the day, and, having sent a camp stool and umbrella to the proper spot, had just settled down to her sketch of the church as seen from the shrubbery, when a maid came hurrying down the path to report that Miss Wilkins had called. Miss Wilkins was one of the few remaining members of the family with whom the Anstruthers had bought the Westfield estate some years back. She had been staying in the neighbourhood, and this was probably a farewell visit. Perhaps you could ask Miss Wilkins to join me here, said Mrs Anstruther, and soon Miss Wilkins, a person of mature years, approached. I'm leaving the ashes tomorrow, and I shall be able to tell my brother how tremendously you have improved the place. Of course, he can't help regretting the old house just a little, as I do myself, but the garden is really delightful now. I'm so glad you can say so, uh, but you mustn't think we've finished our improvements. Let me show you where I mean to put a rose garden. It's close by here. The details of this project were laid before Miss Wilkins at some length, but her thoughts were evidently elsewhere. Yes, delightful, she said at last rather absently. But do you know, Mrs Anstruther, I'm afraid I was thinking of old times. I'm very glad to have seen just this spot again before you altered it. Frank and I had quite a romance about this place. Yes, said Mrs Anstruther smilingly. Do tell me what it was, something quaint and charming, I'm sure. Not so very charming, but it has always seemed to me curious. Neither of us would ever be here alone when we were children, and I'm not sure that I should care about it now, in certain moods. It is one of those things that can hardly be put into words, by me at least, and that sound rather foolish if they are not properly expressed. I can tell you after a fashion what it was that gave us, well, almost a horror of the place when we were alone. 
It was towards the evening of one very hot autumn day, when Frank had disappeared mysteriously about the grounds, and I was looking for him to fetch him to tea, and going down this path I suddenly saw him, not hiding in the bushes as I rather expected, but sitting on the bench in the old summer house. There was a wooden summer house here, you know, up in the corner, asleep, but with such a dreadful look on his face that I really thought he must be ill or even dead. I rushed at him and shook him and told him to wake up, and wake up he did with a scream. I assured you the poor boy seemed almost beside himself with fright. He hurried me away to the house and was in a terrible state all that night, hardly sleeping. Someone had to sit up with him as far as I remember. He was better very soon, but for days I couldn't get him to say why he had been in such a condition. It came out at last that he had really been asleep and he had had a very odd disjointed sort of dream. He never saw much of what was around him, but he felt the scenes most vividly. First, he made out that he was standing in a large room with a number of people in it, and that someone was opposite to him who was very powerful, and he was being asked questions which he felt to be very important, and whenever he answered them, someone, either the person opposite to him or someone else in the room, seemed to be, as he said, making something up against him. All the voices sounded to him very distant, but he remembered bits of the things that were said. Where were you on the 19th of October, and is this your handwriting, and so on? I can see now, of course, that he was dreaming of some trial, but we were never allowed to see the papers, and it was odd that a boy of eight should have such a vivid idea of what went on in a court. All the time he felt, he said, the most intense anxiety and oppression and hopelessness, though I don't suppose he used such words as that to me. Then after that there was an interval in which he remembered being dreadfully restless and miserable, and then there came another sort of picture when he was aware that he had come out of doors on a dark raw morning with a little snow about. It was in a street, or at any rate among houses, and he felt that there were numbers and numbers of people there too, and he was taken up some creaking wooden steps and stood on a sort of platform. But the only thing he could actually see was a small fire burning somewhere near him. Someone who had been holding his arm left hold of it and went towards this fire, and then he said the fright he was in was worse than at any other part of his dream, and if I had not wakened him up he didn't know what would have become of him. A curious child, a curious dream for a child to have, wasn't it? Well, so much for that. It must have been later in the year that Frank and I were here, and I was sitting in the arbour just about sunset. I noticed the sun was going down. I told Frank to run in and see if tea was ready while I finished a chapter in the book I was reading. Frank was away longer than I expected, and the light was going so fast that I had to bend over my book to make it out. All at once I became conscious that someone was whispering to me inside the arbour. The only words I could distinguish, or thought I could, were something like, Pull. Pull. I'll push. You pull. I started up in something of a fright. The voice, it was little more than a whisper, sounded so hoarse and angry, and yet as if it had come from a long, long way off, just as if it had done in Frank's dream. But, though I was startled, I had enough courage to look round and try to make out where the sound came from. And, this sounds very foolish, I know, but it is still the fact, I made sure that it was strongest when I put my ear to an old post which was part of the end of the seat. I was so certain of this that I remember making some marks on the post, as deep as I could with the scissors out of my work basket. I don't know why. I wonder, by the way, whether that isn't the very post itself. Well, yes, it might be. There are marks and scratches on it, but one can't be sure. Anyhow, it was, it was just like that post you have there. My father got to know that both of us had had a fright in the arbour, and he went down there himself one evening after dinner, and the arbour was pulled down at very short notice. I recollect hearing my father talking about it to an old man who used to do odd jobs in the place, and the old man saying, Don't you fear for that, sir. He's fast enough in there without no one don't take and let him out. But when I asked who it was, he told me that he could give no satisfactory answer. Possibly my father or mother might have told me more about it when I grew up, but as you know, they both died when we were still quite children. I must say it has always seemed very odd to me, and I have often asked the older people in the village whether they know of anything strange, but either they know nothing or they wouldn't tell me. Dear, dear, how I've been boring you with my childish remembrances. But indeed that arbour did absorb our thoughts quite remarkably for a time. 
You can fancy, can't you, the kind of stories that we've made up for ourselves? Well, dear Mrs. Anstruther, I must be leaving you now. We shall meet in town this winter, I hope, shan't we? And so on, and so on. The seats and the posts were cleared away, and uprooted, respectively, by that evening. Late summer weather is proverbial, proverbially treacherous, and during dinner time, Mrs. Collins sent up to ask for a little brandy because her husband had took a nasty chill and she was afraid he would not be able to do much the next day. Mrs. Anstruther's morning reflections were not wholly placid. She was sure some roughs had got into the plantation during the night. And another thing, George, the moment that Collins is about again, you must tell him to do something about the owls. I never heard anything like them, and I'm positive one came and perched somewhere just outside our window. If it had come in, I should have been out of my wits. It must have been a very large bird from its voice. Didn't you hear it? No, of course not. You were sound asleep as usual. Still, I must say, George, you don't look as if your, your night's sleep has done you very much good. My dear, I feel as if another of the same would turn me silly. You have no idea of the dreams I've had. I could hardly speak of them when I woke up, and if this room wasn't so bright and sunny, I shouldn't care to think of them even now. Well, really, George, that isn't very common with you, I must say. You must have... No, you only had what I had to eat yesterday. Unless you had tea at that wretched clubhouse, did you? No, 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 nothing but a cup of tea and some bread and butter. I should really like to know how I came to put my dream together as I suppose one does put one's dreams together from a, a lot of little things that one has been seeing or reading. Look here, Mary, it was like this, uh, if I shan't be boring you. I wish to hear what it was, George. I will tell you when I've had enough. All right. I must tell you that it wasn't like other nightmares in one way, because I didn't really see anyone who spoke to me or touched me, and yet I was most fearfully impressed with the reality of it all. At first I was sitting, no, no, moving about in an old-fashioned sort of panelled room. I remember there was a fireplace and a lot of burnt papers in it, and I was in a great state of anxiety about something. There was someone else, a servant, I suppose, because I remember saying to him, Horses as quick as you can, and, and then waiting a bit. And next I heard several people coming upstairs and a noise like spurs on a boarded floor. And then the door opened, and whatever it was that I was expecting happened. Yes, but, but what was that? You see, I couldn't tell. It was the sort of shock that upsets you in a dream. You either wake up or else everything goes black. Well, that was what happened to me. I was in a, a big dark walled room, panelled, I think, like the other, and a number of people. I was evidently standing your trial, I suppose, George. Goodness, yes, Mary, I, I was. But did you dream that too? How very odd. No, no, I didn't get enough sleep for that. Go on, George, and I'll tell you afterwards. Yes, well, I, I, I was being tried for my life, I've no doubt, from the state I was in. I had no one speaking for me, and somewhere there was a most fearful fellow on the bench, I should have said, only he seemed to be pitching into me most unfairly, and twisting everything I said and asking most abominable questions. What about? Well, uh, dates, uh, when I was at particular places, uh, letters I was supposed to have written and why I had destroyed some papers, uh... I recollect his laughing at answers I made in a way that quite daunted me. It doesn't sound much, but I can tell you, Mary, it was, it was really appalling at the time. I'm quite certain there was such a man once, and a most horrible villain he must have been. The things he said. Thank you, I have no wish to hear them. I can go to the links any day myself. How did it end? Oh, against me, he saw to that. I do wish, Mary, I could give you a notion of the strain that came after that. It seemed to me to last for days, waiting and waiting, and sometimes... Writing things I knew to be enormously important to me, and waiting for answers, and none coming, and after that I I came out and... Ah! What, I'm sorry, what, what, what is it? What do you do know what sort of thing I saw? Was it a dark cold day, and snow in the streets, and a fire burning somewhere near you? But, George, it was. You have had the same nightmare. Really? No? Well, well, that is the oddest thing. Yes, I've no doubt it was an execution for, for high treason. I know I was laid up on straw and jolted along most wretchedly, and I had to go up some steps, and someone was holding my arm. I remember seeing a bit of a ladder, and hearing a sound of a lot of people. I really don't think I could bear now to go into a crowd of people and hear the noise they make talking. However, mercifully, I didn't get to the real business. The dream passed off with a sort of thunder inside my head. But, Mary, 
I know what you're going to ask. I suppose this is an instance of a kind of thought reading. Miss Wilkins called yesterday and told me of a dream her brother had as a child when they lived here, and something did no doubt make me think of that when I was awake last night listening to those horrible owls and those men talking and laughing in the shrubbery. Uh, by the way, I wish you would see if they've done any damage and speak to the police about it. And so, I suppose, from my brain it must have got into yours while you were asleep. Curious, no doubt, and I'm sorry it gave you such a bad night. You had better be as much in the fresh air as you can today. Oh, it's all right now, but um, I uh, think I will go over to the lodge and uh, see if I can get a game with any of them. And you? I have enough to do for the morning and this afternoon, if I am not interrupted. There is my drawing. Oh, to be sure, I, I want to see that finished very much. No damage was discoverable in the shrubbery. Mr Anstruther surveyed with faint interest the site of the rose garden, where the uprooted post still lay and the hole it had occupied remained unfilled. Collins, upon inquiry made, proved to be better, but quite unable to come to his work. He expressed by the mouth of his wife, I hope that he hadn't done nothing wrong clearing away them things. Mrs Collins added that there was a lot of talking people in Westfield, and that the old ones were the worst, seemed to think everything of them having been in the parish longer than what other people had. But as to what they said, no more could then be ascertained than that it had quite upset Collins and was a lot of nonsense. Recruited by lunch and a brief period of slumber, Mrs Anstruther settled herself comfortably upon her sketching chair in the path leading through the shrubbery to the side gate of the churchyard. Trees and buildings were among her favourite subjects, and here she had good studies of both. She worked hard, and the drawing was becoming a really pleasant thing to look upon by the time that the wooded hills to the west had shut off the sun. Still, she would have persevered, but the light changed rapidly, and it became obvious that the last touches must be added on the morrow. She rose and turned towards the house, pausing for a time to take delight in the limpid green western sky. Then she passed on between the dark box bushes, and at a point just before the path debauched on the lawn, she stopped once again and considered the quiet evening landscape, and made a mental note that she that must be the tower of one of the roofing churches that, that caught her eye on the skyline. Then a, a bird, perhaps, rustled in the box bush on her left, and she turned and started at seeing what at first she took to be a 5th of November mask, peeping out among the branches. She looked closer. It was not a mask. It was a face large, smooth, and pink. She remembers the minute drops of perspiration which were starting from its forehead. She remembers how the jaws were clean-shaven and the eyes shut. She remembers also, and with an accuracy that makes the thought intolerable to her, how the mouth was open and a single tooth appeared below the upper lip, and as she looked the face receded into the darkness of the bush. The shelter of the house was gained and the door shut before she collapsed. Mr. and Mrs. Anstruther had been for a week or more recruiting at Brighton before they received a circular from the Essex Archaeological Society, and a query as to whether they possessed certain historical portraits, which it was desired to include in the forthcoming work on Essex portraits, to be published under the Society's auspices. There was an accompanying letter from the Secretary, which contained the following passage. We are specially anxious to know whether you possess the original of the engraving of which I enclose a photograph. It represents the Lord Chief Justice under Charles II, who, as you doubtless know, retired after his disgrace to Westfield, and is supposed to have died there of remorse. It may interest you to hear that a curious entry has recently been found in the registers, not of Westfield, but of Prior's Ruthing, to the effect that the parish was so much troubled after his death that the rector of Westfield summoned the parsons of all the Ruthings to come and lay him, which they did. The entry ends by saying the stake is in a field adjoining to the churchyard of Westfield on the west side, Perhaps you can let us know if any tradition to this effect is current in your parish. The incidents which the enclosed photograph recalled were productive of a severe shock to Mrs Anstruther. It was decided that she must spend the winter abroad. Mr Anstruther, when he went down to Westfield to make the necessary arrangements, not unnaturally told his story to the rector, an old gentleman, who showed little surprise. Really, I had managed to piece out for myself very much what must have happened, partly from old people's talk and partly from what I saw in your grounds. Of course, we have suffered to some extent also, 
Yes, it was bad at first, like owls, as you say, and men talking sometimes. One night it was in this garden, and at other times about several of the cottages. But lately there has been very little. I, I think it will die out. There's nothing in our registers except the entry of the burial, and what I took for a long time to be the family motto, but at last I looked at it. I noticed that it was added in a later hand, and had the initials of one of our rectors quite late in the 17th century. Charles Augustine Crompton. Here it is, you see. Quieta non movere. I suppose... Well, it is rather hard to say exactly what I do suppose. And that's the end. And that is the end. That is the end of that. What did we think of that? What did we think of that? Such a sort of... Charming... Home counties, white picket fence, Mr. and Mrs. Anstruther. Just chilling out with the rose gardens and the golf. And then, uh, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, a sweating face in the hedge. That was really horrible, wasn't it? I'll read the description for that again in a minute. Uh, I think that Latin, by the way, quieta non movere, I mean, my Latin ain't great, but I'm pretty sure it means don't move this thing, leave it quiet. Do not move settled things. So yeah, maybe don't dig up the post. The point at which I would have stopped digging up the post is when the previous owner came on and was like, oh yes, I remember this was extremely haunted and this post really freaked me out. Hmm. That's the point at which I would have been like, should we just leave the bush? Should we put the rose garden somewhere else? There isn't even any sun here. So yeah, um, I do have questions. I, do have, I don't feel like that gives you like a complete uh, sort of explanation of what was actually supposed to be happening there. Andrew D, thank you very much for the super chat. That's very generous. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, so just... I want to know theories. I want to know theories. Um... This one was good. Um, oh, where is it? Where is it? I missed it. Oh, no. Oh, Seo says it's definitely a gallows slash execution ground or a burial site. It became haunted because of all the death that happened there. Yeah. That works for me. Gentle Mandrill says, I know I said it before in these streams, but your voice acting is always so on point. Absolutely brilliant. It makes the stories even more enjoyable. The second story was creepy. Like, what was that face? Yeah. Um, yeah. I hope those voices were okay. I would, um, I, I, I don't, I don't know what Mrs. Anstruther was doing. <laughs> exactly. Hmm. But you know what? I sort of made it up in the minute and then I was committed. Nick Jeffrey says, spooktacular, Luke. However, not spooky enough to put me off my chicken stir fry. Yes, that's exactly the right, that's exactly what you want from a ghost story. Creeped out, but not so creeped out that you can't, Demolish a stir fry. Mmm. Man, I'm hungry. Uh, Wayward Kitten, thank you for the super chat. Says, you're always doing such a great job with the voices. Makes these readings even more enjoyable. Thank you. So, yeah. Um, yeah, a pretty creepy one. Pretty creepy one. But a good one, I think. Yeah, I think we can reasonably assume, can't we, that it was some kind of... Um, execution spot burial ground and that's why the dreams were kind of appearing um you could at least make a feature out of the murder post says stephen robson exactly why not like grow some roses around it that could be nice that could be nice uh ryan shad says keep up the great work luke these stories are the perfect kind of spooky vibes i need um let i tell you what should we should we read the description of the face again Then a bird, perhaps, rustled in the box bush on her left, and she turned and started at seeing what at first she took to be a 5th of November mask peeping out amongst the branches. She looked closer. It was not a mask. It was a face, large, smooth, and pink. She remembers the minute drops of perspiration which were starting from its forehead. She remembers how the jaws were clean-shaven and the eyes shut. 
She remembers also, and with an accuracy which makes the thought intolerable to her, how the mouth was open and a single tooth appeared below the upper lip. As she looked, the face receded into the darkness of the bush. The shelter of the house was gained and the door shut before she collapsed. That's the bit that really creeps me out, I think, is like the face is really creepy. The thing I like as well about M.R. James in particular is he sort of sets up this mystery. And it's quite clear what the mystery is at first. It's like spooky spot in the garden. It's giving people nightmares or something like, oh, it seems like. And, you know, there's obviously something to do with a trial. Some people are being hanged or killed here. But then when the actual when the actual horror kicks off, you can't you cannot guess what it is it's like it's always so random and freaky like just a face in the hedge and then the, the thing that creeps me out is the idea of it just like 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 you sort of spot it like and the head, oh, what was those eyes closed jaw clenched mouth open right, right and then as soon as you look it's just like <laughs> creepy Luke's demonstration makes me think of the Homer gif, says Danny McNamara. Yes, Homer just, Homer just like backing into the hedge. I love that. David Smith says, already dead. Congrats. <laughs> mm. Oh, yeah. 5th of November is, I'm sure everyone knows this, but that's um, uh, Guy Fawkes Night. Um... Which is, you know, that thing from uh, FIFA Vendetta, <laughs> you know. Yeah, creepy. The, um, yeah, yeah, creepy one. <laughs> Angela Sanchez says the face business is very unsettling. Yep, 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 yep. Luke Entheus says, yeah, the Homer gif, but spooky and creepy and sweaty and pink with only a single tooth. Yep, yep, yep. Shy Violet says, the shared thoughts part was my favourite. Oh, yeah, that's kind of, I kind of liked that. Um, Let me, let me find that again. Yeah, so that's when Mrs. Anstruther is, like, trying to um, explaining away what happened. That's so, that's so funny. I really, I really enjoy that. It's just like, I know exactly what you were dreaming. I know what you were going to ask. I suppose this is an instance of a kind of thought reading. Yeah, she said, Miss Wilkins called yesterday and told me of a dream her brother had. And something did no doubt make me think of that when I was awake last night, listening to those horrible owls and those men talking and laughing in the shrubbery. And so I suppose from my brain, it must have got into yours while you were asleep. And there's like, yep, yeah, that's going to that's going to work. That's going to work for Mrs. Anstruther for a for an explanation. And what's with the owls? Owls everywhere. <laughs> Nick Jeffrey says, how did Victorians know about the 5th of November before V for Vendetta? <laughs> I wonder what. I'm just going to do a search for Guy Fawkes masks because obviously now the V for Vendetta one is like kind of like the only thing that comes to mind. But like, I wonder if I... But like, I wonder how they like used to look. Real creepy, folks. Real creepy. Oh. Hang on. I'll pull. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, um. I've, I'm on just on the Wikipedia page for Guy Fawkes mask, but like I've got a, um. I'll just pop the, I'll just pop the Wikipedia image link or something in, in the chat. There you go. Like Guy Fawkes masks. Of old. There you go. Have a look at that. Creepy. Very creepy. Hmm. Um, yeah. Don't owls represent omens, says Shy Violet? Yeah, possibly. Itzari says, that's perfectly fine and normal. And MX Tay says, I'm not going to look. Goodness gracious, says Rychix. Yeah, I wonder if I can just search, like, Victorian. But no, not really. Yeah. Yeah. Probably creep myself out. Why would I try and creep myself out more? Yeah, it's kind of Punch and Judy sort of, sort of vibe. Punch, I tell you what. 
it's possible, I guess, if you're from the US that you've not heard of Punch and Judy. If you want, if you really want to creep yourself out, have a look at that. Unbelievable to think that, as a child, I would just regularly see a Punch and Judy show. So creepy. So creepy. Hard pass. Anyway, um, I say regularly. I mean, like, I know occasionally you'd be at some village fete or something and be kicking off. Hmm. It's a traditional, um, children's puppet show. Uh, NimbleTax says there's a Punch and Judy story by M.R. James. Is there? Is there? Is there? Huh. Emily says Punch and Judy were a staple to many beach holidays. Okay, well, those were two good stories. I think that's going to do it for us for this stream. Um, I'm not sure I will be around next week because I have some time off work. Um, so I don't know what I will be doing, but possibly I will be trying to just generally sort of not be living in the YouTube um, back end. And by back end, I mean, like, interface and stuff. That wasn't a euphemism. <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks for joining along, as always, folks. I always enjoy doing these. Um, always, I love, love seeing your reactions in the chat. Especially when, like, the scary bit kicks in. Really cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, uh, Salt K, thank you very much for the super chat. It says, thank you for another evening of high quality spooky entertainment. Well, thank you. I do my best. Uh, will you be doing a live stream Monday, says Antonk. Yes, yes, I'm, wor I'm, yeah, I'm at work on Monday. Um, I will be doing a Bloodborne uh, appreciation stream where I don't play Blood Bloodborne. I just talk about Bloodborne. Uh, you know, reminisce about boss fights and stuff like that. Jane Cluett says, thanks for another spooktacular, Luke. Could you wish me luck? I'm DMing my first D&D campaign starting tomorrow. Oh my goodness, Jane, that's so exciting. You're going to do absolutely great. I'll wish you luck, but you won't need it. You'll do great. You'll do great. Remember, everyone's on your, everyone around the table is on your side. Um, and do not underestimate the, like, when I've, I've, I've done a little DMing now and every time I say something when I'm DMing I'm like they're not going to take this seriously because I'm just making it up but like the, the sort of the there's something really magical about just like when everyone's just going along with it like at the point where you can see like the players like are starting to stress and go like oh no oh no oh no oh no and you're like oh my gosh it's working I'm DMing this is awesome you're gonna feel you're gonna get that Jane Cluett and you're gonna have a great time um I think you'll love it. Jeremy Rock, thank you very much. The little, oh, little emoji. Hang on, what's, it's a, it's a, some sort of fox. He's writing, writing, he's writing, he's writing on some sort of paper. And he's saying, what does it say? It's, hang on. It says, number one. <laughs> thank you. John Burnham says, cheers for the streams. Have you read any Algernon Blackwood or E.F. Benson stories? And take care of yourselves, everyone. Yes, take care of yourselves, everyone. Thanks, John Burnham. Um, yes, I've been looking into Algernon Blackwood. That's good stuff. E.F. Benson I've not heard of, though. So that will go on the list. I'll check that out. Um, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. All right. All right. I hope everyone has a wonderful Friday. Take it easy. And... Um, yeah, thanks for tuning in. Uh, I think that all that really remains is for me to say, as ever, stay safe out there, have a lovely time, goodbye everyone, and remain unhaunted!